are here to learn. I hope that when you leave here, you will have a better appreciation for what Birmingham had and unfortunately lost when they took down Terminal Station. Uh, obviously, this is not Terminal Station. <laughs> this is Trussell's original depot that was built in, in the late 1800s. This photograph is from 1912. So, just to show you what it looked like then, and this was a standard construction for rural depots in Alabama, along the Alabama Great Southern between Birmingham and Chattanooga. Those of you who do remember the depot probably remember it looking something like this. This is how the depot looked in the 1960s. I don't know exactly when the station was removed, but <clears throat> right up until the end, it was an active agency serving local companies around Trussell. Of course, the passenger trains were long gone by that time, and we'll talk about that so we can understand just what happened to cause the passenger trains and terminal station to go away. Uh, just to give you an overview of the presentation, I'm gonna talk with you about the conditions that were leading up to the construction of terminal station. How did Birmingham happen to get one of the finest railway stations in the country? Talk a little bit about the design and construction. It was very unique in its design. We'll talk some about the development of the station, the operations, and a look at some of the named trains that ran through the station. How many of you ever took a train from Birmingham Terminal Station? Okay, all right. Well, you might see some trains then that you remember from your traveling days. Uh, we'll also talk about the station's gradual demise. What, what happened to cause us to lose Terminal Station and the circumstances that led up to its removal. And then a little bit about the aftermath and the legacy of Terminal Station. We no longer have the station, but we have a lot of landmarks that have been preserved because we lost Terminal Station. And I'll talk with you a little bit about that too. If you would, just please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. I think we'll have plenty of time. We've got the room for the afternoon. So uh, we'll just, you know, we'll try to cover everything before we leave. Okay, so let's get right to it. We're gonna take a sentimental journey back to Terminal Station. For some of you, as I said, this will be something that you will remember. For others, it will be something new that you will learn about. This is the original station as it was constructed as it opened in 1909. But this is probably, whoops, wrong slide. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself here. This is how most of you probably remember Terminal Station, those of you who do. This is a photograph from the 1950s. At this point, the station was already showing some signs of decline because pretty much the passenger trains were going away during the 1950s, but it still had a few more good years. Getting back to the book, you'll notice that first image that I showed you of the station, which is the oldest image, which I like so much that I decided to use it for the book cover. And the title of the book is Great Temple of Travel, because that's how it was known. And I think you can look at it and understand why. It looked very much like a European temple. It was actually designed after a mosque. We'll talk about that some too. Okay, well, just a little personal history. My family moved to Birmingham when I was a, <clears throat> a young teenager. And being a young rail fan, of course, I immediately went out and started exploring all of the railroads. You know, I was like a kid in a candy store. I had never seen so many trains in my life. And this was one of the first things that caught my eye was this magnificent railroad station. So when I was about 14 years old, I remember riding the bus from Huffman back into town. And I got off the bus at the foot of 26th Street and 1st Avenue North, and I walked back up on the viaduct to take this picture, 1st Avenue Viaduct, if you know where that is. And this is one of the very first pictures I took of a railroad in Birmingham, and that was the terminal station. And as I looked around at what I saw, I happened to notice that little concrete pillbox up there in this circle. So I wanted to find out what that was about. I thought it had something to do with running the trains, but I definitely wanted to investigate and find out. 
So I made my way up to the tower. This is a photograph that came to me by a subscriber to the Birmingham Terminal Station Facebook page. By the way, you might want to take a look at that. It's got hundreds of photographs of the station. We've learned so much more about the station from people that actually worked there since this, since this started. But this particular picture came to me from the daughter of this gentleman seated here. His name is Dennis Trim. And that's me at 14 years old. And I didn't have a photograph of myself in the tower, so I was just tickled to death to get that photograph. Uh, I don't know what happened to the hair, but <laughs> time, I guess. So back in the day, if a kid wanted to work for the railroad, what he did is he just started hanging around. Uh, yeah, just started hanging around until one of two things happened. They either ran you off or they hired you. Okay? In my case, I made such a nuisance of myself, they finally hired me. So uh, I started learning the job, as every young man does, cubbed the job, as they called it, for the gentleman you see sitting there at the control board that operated all the tracks and all the signals in the station. The gentleman sitting on the desk is Mr. C.L. Bradford. He's the terminal superintendent. And we have a lady with us who remembers these folks because her husband, Don Carlisle, also worked there. That's Nancy Carlisle. Glad to have you with us, Nancy. It's always good to see someone in the audience who actually worked at the station or had a connection to the station. So we're especially grateful for that. So I started qualifying for the job and I hired out at the age of 17 operating that control board and all the tracks and the signals. And I was happy there and I would have probably worked there until they tore the station down except for one thing. The Army had other plans. <laughs> so, I got my draft notice. And when I was leaving, <clears throat> Mr. Murray said goodbye. And he said, you know, Clemens, he said, when you get back from the Army, he said, this will all be gone. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm coming back to my job. He said, you watch. Okay. Mr. Murray had been there since before World War II. And he had seen all the changes that had taken place over a period of about 20 years with the station and with the trains. And he saw the end coming. So when I left Terminal Station to go to the Army in 1968, this is what I saw. This is what was there then. So there's the station. There's all the tracks and so forth. So I went off to the Army and I came back in 1972 from Vietnam and this is what I found. What happened to the station? Okay. Mr. Murray was right. He was prophetic. He saw the end was near. And when it happened, it happened rather quickly. So what you have here are just the two tracks that were left and the one platform that were left to serve the three trains that were left out of the 52 something trains that were operating through the station in 1952. Okay, so I said we talk about the conditions that led up to the construction of the station. A little history here. What we have are the first railroads to enter what was then Ealington, which became Birmingham. That was the south of North Alabama, from Louisville and Nashville, from Decatur down to Montgomery and the Alabama and Chattanooga that ran from Chattanooga down to Meridian, which passed through Trussville, which was the first major rail line in, in, in Alabama. So where those crossed became the city of Birmingham. This was the first Alabama and Chattanooga station to be built in this new city of Birmingham in the 1860s. Uh, you might say Birmingham was a one locomotive town at that time, just getting started. But it wasn't long before more railroads and more trains started coming into the Birmingham district for all of the minerals, all of the iron ore, all of the limestone, all of the coal in these mountains. And taking that out and taking it down to the steel plants and the iron mills and taking out all the finished goods to the country. And it required a lot of transportation to do that. So the railroads were really anxious to come into Birmingham and tap into that. 
So as things began to expand, they needed a little bit more station. And at that, at that time, it was very common to have motels, hotels, inns, whatever you want to call them, uh, next to the depot for people that were traveling, had to stay overnight to catch their train out the next day or whatever. So this is the original relay house. And if that name's familiar to you, if you recall the Banker Savings Building that was built down on the corner of 20th Street and 1st Avenue, well, the Relay House was the club that was on the top of the Banker Savings Building. It was at that location. But even this began to become inadequate for the number of passengers traveling through Birmingham. So the LN built the first real union station in Birmingham to serve the railroads that were then coming through Birmingham. This is the LN Depot. Like I said, on the corner there of Morris Avenue and, and uh, 20th Street, kind of a Queen Anne style building, very ornate. And out behind it, you had this large shed that had four tracks, four tracks, to serve all of the trains that were coming in and out of Birmingham. Again, that was adequate for a time, but then again, it began to be crowded. This isn't exactly following the same process and showing you the images that I would like, but I will explain it to you. The L&N and the Southern were the first two railroads, as I mentioned. And then one by one, these other railroads began to come into Birmingham. The Frisco in 1887 from Amory, Mississippi. Central Georgia in 1888 from Columbus, Georgia. The Seaboard in 1904 from Atlanta. And the Illinois Central, the last to arrive in 1908. It came down by trackage rights <coughs> over the Southern Railway and the Frisco to get into Birmingham. So here we had what a total of six railroads now, all trying to use that one station. By 1905, there were 74 trains trying to enter and leave this little four track station. And as you can see, things began to get crowded. They were having difficulty just getting trains in and out of the station. So something else had to happen. And the LNN owned that building. So they told their other major tenant, tenant, the Southern Railway, they had to pack up and leave. Just take their trains and go. So they basically, in 1905, informed the Southern Railway that they would have to be out of there by January the 1st of 1907. So that gave Southern Railway two years to build a new station, given the other railroads that were coming into the LN station and move all of their trains out. So here we have the LN station, which is now the current Amtrak station located down on Morris Avenue. And then over there you see the site of Terminal Station. And it's right along 26th Street there at 5th Avenue North. The Southern Railway already owned all of that property, most of it anyway. So they just decided that would be a good place to build their new terminal station. So the first thing they did was raise a $2 million stock issue to be able to finance this station, which by the way is equivalent to about $90 million in today's money, just to give you an idea of the cost. And it wound up costing them $3 million before it was over with. They had cost overruns even back in the day. A million dollars is a pretty good piece of change. But they kept running into more and more problems with construction, and they kept having to raise more money in order to finish it. Okay, so now they had the initial funds to do the construction. They needed an architect. And this gentleman, Fort Myray, he was a Virginian. And he had traveled all over Europe gathering ideas for designs for buildings. And he had the idea for this new terminal station that the Southern Railway wanted to build in Atlanta. And they had a contest for the best design. So he submitted his design and he won out. And this is the new Atlanta terminal station that he designed. And you can certainly see the European influence in that structure. His buildings incorporated a lot of different designs, but none more than Birmingham Terminal Station. They were so pleased with the Atlanta Terminal Station, they gave them the contract to do Mobile. There's Mobile Station, which is the only of the three stations still surviving. It sat there derelict for many years in a kind of run 
down part of Mobile out near the docks. So they were either going to tear it down or they were going to restore it. And fortunately, the city fathers and some others had a vision for that, and they did raise the money to restore the station. And there it is, as it appears today. It's used for some city offices and from some other organizations. Well, there again, they liked that so much that they awarded him the contract for Birmingham's terminal station. And this was the design. He called this his best work. And those of you who remember the station would agree it was unique. It did incorporate elements of just about everything. It had bow arts, it had Byzantine, it had some Romanesque arches, just pretty much, you know, everything he could put into one building, he did it. And this is, uh, the structure itself ran three city blocks. That's how long it was. The entire complex took up 10 acres. It was a large facility with tracks and so forth. The floor plan that you see here in the middle, of course, that's the main waiting room. It has 7,600 square feet. It had Tennessee marble across the floors and 16 feet up the walls. It had all of the latest design elements in it as far as, you know, fixtures, you know, electrical, plumbing, whatever they had, they put into that building. You had a separate, but equal facility, or well, maybe not quite so equal facility for African Americans over here on the very far right. You might see what looks like a small waiting room, and then they had their own cafeteria and their own restrooms there, and they had their own separate entrance on the side. And then what you have on the very far end down there on the left is a formal dining room, and it was a destination kind of like Highland Park Grill was today. Folks went there, you know, they traveled some distance to just come here and eat at the Terminal Station dining room. Apparently, from what anyone can tell, Byron was very influenced by the Hagia Sophia temple in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. And I think you can certainly see some of those design elements from that temple in Terminal Station, the main dome, the Twin Towers. Okay, so they had the architect, they had the plan, and now it was time for construction. So here we have the very earliest scene from that construction. You can see that the very far south wing is being built, and then the first tower, which were just decorative, they weren't functional, they were just part of the design. And then what you have here, in the front is the forms that were being used for the new Fifth Avenue underpass, which you can still drive through today, where I still go and blow my horn every chance I get. I've got this overlay to show you where the red circle is. Those are steps leading from the street level down into the Fifth Avenue tunnel. You could actually access the streetcar line directly from the sidewalk. It was like all weather. And they had the same thing in the passenger pedestrian subway where you could step off the streetcar in Fifth Avenue Tunnel, walk up a flight of steps, be in the passenger tunnel, and walk up to your train. Never get in the weather. Of course, you needed a ticket, but. So here are some of the very earliest pictures of construction. So here we have the tracks that are going in. These are the sheds. And then you see what looks like a canopy that's spread over all of the tracks. That was something totally new for its day. It was a concrete, formed concrete canopy that covered all 10 tracks. This is underneath, looking up. So you can see the canopy part that covered the, the platforms and then the platform sheds themselves here over the platform. The idea of the design was to take all the smoke and fumes out from underneath the shed and exhaust them through the top of the canopy. Unfortunately, it was like a bad chimney. It didn't draft well. It kept all the smoke and fumes down on the platform. <laughs> so that was not to last. Well, here it was, June of 1907, and they still hadn't completed the station. And they were supposed to be evicted the first of that year. And then gave them until the end of June to get
get out. That's it. We're done. Finished. So here they announced opening the station at once. They had no choice. And even though the station itself wasn't ready, they used the baggage room, which had been constructed. Here we have the postal annex here on the south end. That's where the U.S. mail came in. <clears throat> and then you have the, um, um, okay, the platform. Then you have the baggage room. And so for a while, that's where all the trains that came in and out had to go. And sometimes there were a thousand or more passengers trying to cram themselves into the baggage room to get on the train. So things got a little heavy there, and they were in a hurry to get that station open. Finally, in 1909, early 1909, the station was complete. This is one of the very earliest pictures of the station right at the time it opened. So here we're standing in the Fifth Avenue subway looking to the east, okay? There weren't even trolley tracks there yet. It was that new. They had not yet put the trolley in although Birmingham did have a trolley system at that time. So on April the 6th, 1909, they had the grand opening of Birmingham's Great Temple of Travel. And this is an artist rendition. I don't think that 26th Street ever looked that good, <laughs> but you get the idea, of course. This was for postcards, you know, to send to, the, to relatives, you know, the new Great Temple of Travel opened in Birmingham. Alabama. And of course, artists had their own ideas about how they wanted to render the building and how they wanted it to appear. So this is an artist rendition of the interior of the temple, of the temple, listen to me, of the station. Now, that's a little overdone, okay? Yeah, it was grand, but it wasn't quite that grand. This looks more like Pennsylvania Station than it does <laughs> Birmingham Terminal Station, but it captures the elements. There's those tall Romanesque windows that let the sunlight just stream in in the morning on one side and in the afternoon on the other. And during the day, the sun would move across that marble floor of the station. And the leaded color lights, or leaded colored glass that was in the dome, reflected down. All those colors were like a rainbow that moved across the floor of the station. Kind of a nice effect. In reality, though, it looked like this, which ain't shabby. No, not at all. So you had these two large barrel vaults with this Gustavino tile, which was a totally new concept. Those actually added to the strength of the structure, these barrel vaults. And then, of course, the main dome is above you. We'll take a look at that in a minute. These large chandeliers, they had three of those in the station. So this is looking up, and you can see the Gustavino tile vault. Of course, this was taken in the 1960s, and that's the glass that was in the dome, but you can't see out of it because it was so covered up with smoke and soot, accumulated over 60 years, right? You can make out a little bit there, kind of the design of that one glass panel. And when they dropped that dome, of course, all that glass shattered, except a few pieces. And they were saved, and the Birmingham History Museum was able to get one, and I was able to get a picture of it, just to give you an idea of what that looked like. It was a very small, leaded glass panel that was just completely covering that 65-foot wide dome that was 100 feet tall above the floor of the station. So it was quite impressive. This is a favorite shot of mine. This was taken from an army blimp in the late afternoon, this is looking down at the station from the west. It's bathed in that sunlight in the afternoon. That just really gives you an idea of the overall scale, the magnitude of that structure. From end to end, including the postal facility and the railway express, it was five city blocks long. I mentioned the postal facility, which was on the south end of the station. This is looking to the south. And then on the north end, we had what was being called the Railway Express. How many of you remember Railway Express? Ever ship anything? Railway Express. Remember the little green trucks? You kind of went around like FedEx? That was the forerunner of FedEx and UPS. At one time, just about everything express shipped by rail, just like mail. And almost all went by rail. 
So here's some early shots taken down at ground level. I mentioned that there was one waiting room separate for the African Americans, and this is it right here. And you can see the horse and buggy, because this is before the Model T, y'all, okay? Horse and buggy, you're sitting at, at, this is waiting for someone to use or come out of that entranceway there, which went into the waiting room for the African Americans. Then on the other end of the station, I mentioned to you the dining room, and that's the dining room there on the corner of the station. And so, you know, Model T's, Model A's, whatever. So this was from the 1920s. How many of you have ever seen this scene? Okay, the Magic City sign? Sure, yeah, it was a real landmark in Birmingham. And this is not backward, by the way. That's the way it originally appeared. Because the idea was when somebody stepped out of the waiting room at Terminal Station, that's the first thing they saw was welcome to Birmingham, the Magic City. And it was neon and it lit up at night, right? That was a nice view. And it was a gift to the city in 1926 from a Birmingham businessman, Mr. E.M. Elliott. This is how most of you may have seen it on a picture postcard. Reverse, so you can read it. <laughs> the Magic City, Terminal Station, and Subway. Unfortunately, it fell into disrepair, much like the station did. In the 1950s, they were going to have to, you know, spend about $3,000 to repair it, to keep it alive, and the city council would not approve the funds. They said, you know, the station's falling apart, we don't need to rebuild the sign, forget it. <laughs> so, they scrapped the sign. I usually like to talk a little bit before I see this picture, but I can't right now because I can't get a preview of it, but, uh, of all the pictures that I have been able to acquire over 50 years of collecting, I have yet to come across a photograph of passengers at the station. For whatever reason, very few pictures are taken of people. Mm -hmm. And I don't really understand that, okay? But anyway, because of the Terminal Station Facebook page, someone came up with this photograph, and they said that it was taken at Terminal Station during World War II as a trainload of GIs pulled out, and there's the wives and the girlfriends all wishing them farewell. And I took their word for that, but that just looks too happy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, and even the old conductor down there is breaking a smile. So I have a feeling, you know, this was probably a stage photograph from some place, but you know this scene happened many, many times during the war, World War I, World War II, when the nation was mobilizing, and we had, you know, dozens of troop trains passing through Birmingham almost every day, so I can't, I can't dispute it. Well, I mentioned the station was built in 1909, and it went through two world wars before they finally decided it needed an update, okay? By that time, it was totally worn out just for use, everything about it. So in 1943, the railroads put $500,000 into making updates of the station, updating the wiring, the plumbing, just adding on and then completely pressure washing the, ins the outside of the building, which you know, really would make it sparkle again. This is the one and only time they spent any money on doing any improvements to that station. That was it. And that was in 1943. So here we have a photograph of the station in the 1950s. I'm sure you can recognize from the cars about the period of time that was taken. But what's important here is not what's going on outside the station, but what's going on inside the station. I mentioned to you that the facility was segregated as were all public facilities in Alabama by law at that time. But a local black minister by the name of Reverend Fred Shuttlewood decided that he was going to challenge that law at Terminal Station because it was a public convenience and he felt like that he had a right, as others did, to use that facility. So <clears throat> he and Mrs. Shuttlesworth went in and took a seat in the middle of the white waiting room and just sat there. They were waiting on a train. And this gentleman, Lamar Weaver, who was uh, from up north, uh, one of those agitators, heard of him. He came down to wish them well 
just to make a public display of support for the Shuttlesworths. Well, in the meantime, there was a reception committee outside waiting for Mr. W Mr. Weaver to step outside, and they were doing their best to turn over his car. Yeah. So, you know, uh, they rocked him and, you know, just tried to make a mess of things. And I, I just thought it was really ironic that right above this photograph of these gentlemen rocking his car, there's a sign that says, a turn, attend church somewhere Sunday. <laughs> just one of the contradictions of that era that we still lived in, in many respects. Well, the law was challenged, and it went up and down in the courts, you know, for several years. And then finally, in April of 1961, federal court ordered the desegregation of Terminal Station, which became the first public facility in Birmingham to be integrated. So it also has that distinction. Well, we can't talk about the station without talking about some of the trains that served the station. That was its purpose. That's what it was there for. And we had some grand trains that operated through Birmingham at that time. This is just a typical scene here during the afternoon lull, as we called it, between the morning rush and the afternoon rush of passenger trains. Here you see several railroads represented. I just want to take you one by one briefly through those railroads and let you see some pictures of some of those trains. You have to think about the railroads as airlines today competing with each other for passengers with all their publicity and marketing and so forth. So they went to great lengths to try to attract passengers onto their trains. This is Southern Railway's timetable, very colorful piece of art on the cover, somewhere up in Virginia, just to give you an idea of the scenery that that railroad passed through. And this green and gold color scheme was also found on their locomotives. This is one of their finest steam locomotives running with the Birmingham Special that operated through Trussville. Of course, it didn't slow down. <laughs> it was probably doing about 80 <laughs> when it came through town. But Southern Railway was the largest operator in the station, had the finest trains for many years, and this is one of the finest, the Birmingham Special. Well, of course, the steam era came up into the 30s when diesel electric began to be popular as a means of locomotion. So the railroads were adopting these new diesel electric locomotives instead of these steam engines because they polluted less, they were more efficient, they could pull more cars at faster speed, and so forth and so on. So in 1941, Southern introduced their new Southerner that operated between New York and New Orleans. And here it is with its sister train, the Tennessean, ran between New York and, and Memphis. These cars and these, this train carried all the latest improvements in passenger service. It was all air conditioned, very comfortable throughout, dining car, sleeping car, it had it all. And this is a picture of one of those brand new diesel electric locomotives, also in the same color scheme, green and gold, and it's lettered the Southern. Some of the interiors of those cars I'd like for you to see. This is the comfort that you would find in those coaches. Wide seats, okay? Long, deep leg rests, fully reclining. And then at night they come through, turn the lights off and give everybody a pillow and a blanket for a good night's sleep. And you really could sleep on the train. They were comfortable. Of course, if you wanted to splurge and go first class, you could get yourself a bedroom, right? And then of course you'd have a Pullman porter who would come to your room and he would bring you your meals or drinks or whatever you wanted, make down your bed at night, make it up in the morning, and then you'd have that car during the day for just comfort and travel. But one thing that really attracted people to the different passenger trains were the dining cars. Railroads competed with each other for the best dining service on their trains. They had local specialties on their trains depending on the regions that they went through. Like the LNN had seafood buffets from the coast. Southern had chicken, spring chicken, you know, from the south and so forth and so on. This is just to give you an idea of the interior of one of those dining cars. White tablecloth, heavy silver, fine china. 
who would want to travel on a train? The Frisco Railroad that came down from Memphis, of course, they wanted to show their patriotic colors. So during World War II, they put the V for victory on their timetable covers and painted them red, white, and blue. And they carried that color scheme over to their, oops, not so fast, to their steam locomotive. This is the Kansas City, Florida Special arriving from Memphis on its way to Jacksonville, Florida. That train was handed off in Birmingham to the Southern Railroad that took it to Atlanta and down to Jacksonville. Very handsome train. But there again, it's not the outside of the train that appealed to passengers, it was what was on the inside. And when you stepped into a lounge car for drinks or for socialization on the Kansas City Florida Special, this is what awaited you. A living room, right? Stuffed furniture, you know, matching carpet, Venetian blinds. There's even a working fireplace in this car. I believe it was propane. I doubt if it was wood. Mm -hmm. It'd be a problem with the ashes. But they just wanted you to feel at home the moment you walked onto that train. You wanted to have all the comforts of home for that trip wherever you were going. And what I like to ask folks is if you had a choice between riding in this car from say here to Kansas City or flying Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> any, any takers? <laughs> When the Frisco decided to go with diesel electric motors, they also wanted to make a statement. So they painted all their engines a bright fire engine red, not to be missed. <clears throat> and here's the sunny land that's just arrived in Birmingham one morning <clears throat> early, catching the first light of the morning, beautifully lit photograph there with terminal station in the background. Central Georgia, which was a regional carrier that came into Birmingham from Columbus, but it carried two of the finest trains that ran through Birmingham, the Seminole and the City of Miami. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. And their motto was a handful of strong freight lines. So you see that, and that kind of overlays their railroad map. But someone pointed out to me, it appears they're giving Birmingham a middle finger. I'm sure that's an accident. I don't think that was intentional. Their famous train was the Seminole that operated between Chicago and Jacksonville. A friend of mine here, Donnie Parsons, had a relative who worked on the railway post office, probably on this train, Donnie, because it ran through Carbondale on its way to Chicago. The Seminole has some notoriety for one particular reason. It was Al Capone's favorite train. So whenever Scarface traveled between Chicago and West Palm Beach, he rode the Seminole. You know, he just bought out a car, brought all this retinue with him, and rode through town. I would love to find a picture of him walking around the station with a cigar, but that hasn't shown up yet. When the Central of Georgia decided that they would get the diesel electric locomotives, they also wanted to have something people would recognize. And what else for the Georgia Railroad, the Confederate blue and gray, right? So there it is. I mentioned the Illinois Central. Here's their timetable color from the 1940s. That particular scene, if you recognize it, happens to be Birmingham skyline off of Red Mountain. They like to feature locations along their rail line, just for local interest. Here's their very first train to operate into the station before it was even officially opened. And this is the Southeastern Limited from Chicago. 1908. When they decided to go streamlined, they wanted to make a statement. And they already had a couple of famous trains, the City of New Orleans, the Panama Limited that ran from Chicago to New Orleans. So they came up with a train from Chicago to Birmingham, excuse me, to Miami, called the City of Miami. And it was one of a kind. Not another train like it in the country. And you can see from the colors, it was very tropical. And that's the impression they wanted to give. You're already in Miami when you get on this train, okay? It had like a bow wave that went across the front, you know, like you're breaking through water. And these lovely citrus colors. When you went inside, that color scheme was carried through to the lounge car. This is the bamboo grove, which incorporated real bamboo in the decor. You can see sort of the palm 
same motif on the carpet. And then when you went back into the rear observation car, when you could sit and look out, this is what you found again, just carrying that whole color scheme through. I mean, they had interior designers doing all of this back in the day for these trains. By the way, that car is still existing down in Florida. It's now there, it's been restored. It's uh, serving as sort of a meeting room for a retirement community. And then the Seaboard. The Seaboard's motto was a route of courteous service. And having known the Seaboard folks, like all the others, they were a fine group of people. And I got to know many of them very well. This is the Seaboard's, one of their two passenger trains, the Cotton State Special, that operated from Birmingham to Washington. It competed with the Southern. And you can look over there on the left, and you can see Southern's new diesel electric locomotive that the Southern was ready to pull out. So they were a little bit ahead of times here with the Seaboard, but Seaboard was going to catch up. And they did so with the Silver Comet. The Silver Comet that was introduced in 1947. It was a fine train. Here we have a picture of it. Oh, this thing's pretty. Uh, here we have the train leaving Terminal Station in the 1950s. It had the citrus colors also. It was a Florida-based railroad. It was a very big train on its way to New York. Well, back in the day, you know, the railroads, like the airlines, would try to compete for passengers, and they always liked to get a celebrity on their train if they could. And, of course, the Western train between Chicago and Los Angeles had no problem. They had celebrities riding every day. But it was a little harder to find someone around Birmingham that, you know, would really make notice. So they had the idea of having Miss Alabama ride the Silver Comet to Atlantic City every year. And of course, that always gained them some publicity. So here we see a group waving goodbye to Gwen Harmon in 1952. While some people left on the train, other personalities arrived on the train, and Seaboard managed to get Santa to arrive on the Silver Comet, where he would lead a parade from the station down to Loveland's as part of opening up you know, the Christmas shopping season. Well, we can talk about the trains, but you have to talk about the people that made the trains run. And this is a typical crew of a passenger train. Here we have, this is the Seaboard Silver Comet. On the left is Mr. Jackson, he is the porter. And next to him is Mr. Lee, he is the baggage master. Mr. Brown, he is the flagman. And then Mr. Anderson, who is the conductor. And back in the day, these gentlemen would take someone like myself under their wing and sort of bring you along into the fellowship of railroaders. And I was very fortunate to get to know many of them. And you always had a favorite. And my favorite was this gentleman you see here waving at the camera. This is taken from an old eight millimeter movie, so it's, it's not really that good. But this is Mr. Tal Alderson. He was the senior conductor on the Seaboard Silver Comet. So, the day that Mr. Alderson retired, I was working up in the control tower. I'm 17 years old. And I'm just getting started, and he's been out on the railroad for 50 something years, and he's working his last day. So I'm sitting there operating the control panel, and he walks over to me, and he said, well, son, he said, this is my last day on the railroad. He said, it's been a good run. He said, you're just starting out. He said, so I want you to have something for your journey. And he gave me his gold watch. No way. So that has become a prized possession, needless to say. And that was every railroader's trademark was his gold watch, and I just couldn't be more honored than to have that watch. But that's just the way they were. Well, here's a picture of the Silver Comet leaving the station, but what I want you to notice is what's circled there. And that's an airplane on approach to Birmingham Airport. The reason I show you that is because by the time this picture was taken, more and more people were flying <coughs> than riding the train. You know, it would just get you there faster, okay? So that was obvious, and the fares were very competitive. Here's Birmingham Airport during that era with the new Delta four-prop plane. And at the same time, the interstate highway 
system is being developed. And here's a map of it. And what's really interesting is if you take the existing railroad passenger routes and overlay them with the interstate highway map, they were almost identical. Which means that you could get in your car at your convenience and leave and go just about anywhere you wanted to in the country or you could ride a train was a lot more convenient. Stop along the way, see what you wanted to, arrive when you wanted to. The railroad simply could not compete with that convenience. So between the airlines and automobiles, the railroads are having a real hard time keeping passengers on their trains. Here's a photograph of the station in the early 1960s, and you can see there are very few trains in that station, even on the left there. Those tracks are what we call the Pullman yard, and they used to be full of railroad cars waiting to go out. It's empty. So this is what was happening throughout the 1960s. The trains were coming off. If you look inside of the station at that time, it looks pretty much like it always did, unless you looked a little closer. That nice dining room that you saw earlier had been, you know, closed and it was now a four stool cafe where you could grab a greasy hamburger maybe between trains. The soda fountain had closed. You couldn't get a beverage. You couldn't get a newspaper. You know, you'd just be sitting there all day waiting for your train that may or may not come because most of them were running late by that time. And if you looked around the inside of the station, you could see the signs of decay taking place. Plaster off the walls, no attempt to repair or replace it. If you went outside and looked up at the towers, of course, you could see windows broken out. No, no attempts to replace or repair those. If you looked along the roof line in the back, you can see it sagging in places across the top of the express house. If you look at the dome, you can see all the tiles that are missing. The leaks were already beginning to develop. The station was just literally falling apart. If you went down into the pedestrian subway that went under the tracks to take you to the platforms, there again you can see plaster gone and water seeping in, no attempts to make any repairs. As early as 1962, the railroads tipped their hand that they wanted to get rid of Terminal Station. Even though they still had a respectable number of trains, there were still about 26 trains operating in the early 1960s, but they were looking for a buyer. And they thought they had found one in the U.S. Postal Service. So they negotiated to buy that property, take down the station, and build a totally new regional postal facility for Birmingham but the price was too high. By the time they took the building down, built a new facility on the land, it was over budget. So that didn't happen. So here we have the new post office going in just a few blocks over where it is now and Saddle Terminal Station over there looking on forlornly, just waiting for its day. I mentioned that the trains were going away one by one trains disappeared and they started posting these notices of discontinuance. Here's the last Frisco passenger train to leave the station on December 12, 1967. They were the first railroad to completely pull out of the station. Here you can see the arrival and departure boards that are being just marked through. All the Frisco trains are gone. All the seaboard trains are gone. All the Southern Railway schedules are being changed or eliminated. And this was what was happening all through the 60s. The final blow came in September of 1967 when the post office decided to take all the first class mail off the train. Up until that time, most first class mail still ran by rail. They had railway post office cars and they actually had clerks sorting mail in route and dropping mail off at all these little stations. Trustville, for instance, they had a mail hook here. And the postmaster would go out and hang the bag there on the hook for the train that came through, and they'd grab the bag, take the mail, and sort it in route, going up to Chattanooga. So, but that was that was going away because with fewer train schedules, the post office had fewer trains they could rely on to get the mail there. So they went to trucks. And that was the beginning of the end. The last run of the Seminole was in June of 1968. 
And the last one of the silver column was in January of 1969 on a sad, rainy day. I will give this to the Seaboard. Up until the very last day, they operated a full train with sleeping cars, dining cars, and lounge cars, and all the convenience that they ever had. They never cut back on their service, like some railroads. They started eliminating dining service, sleeping cars, and so forth, because the passengers just weren't using them. So here we have a headline from January of 69, that same month, Terminal Waits Last All Aboard. Gertie in the shuttle, she waits for the end. And this was a picture taken around that time just to show you how vacant the station had become. So this headline appeared on June the 18th of 1969. The railroads appeal to the Public Service Commission to abandon terminal station, take it down, and replace it with a little smaller concrete block station to serve the few trains that were still running. And that's really all they needed, plus just two tracks and a platform. And of course, the Public Service Commission only had to decide one thing. Did it serve the public convenience? And it did not, because the passengers weren't there. It no longer met that criteria, and the railroads could prove it. They had all the numbers. They showed the decline. Of course, they were losing money like crazy on passenger service and the terminal station and other large stations like it. So that very day, the Public Service Commission issued an order saying that they could remove terminal station and that it would be done post haste. But at that same meeting, a gentleman spoke up, a gentleman by the name of William Engel, who was a Birmingham realtor. You may still see some of the signs of his real estate company around Birmingham on commercial property. Mr. Engel was very successful in taking the old l and Union Station site and converting that into the Bank of Savings building. So he had some experience working with railroads and doing that. So he approached the railroad about taking that property and building the new regional social security building on that site, a $10 million complex that would also have a hotel and some other mixed use, you know, stores and so forth. And that was going to anchor the eastern area of downtown Birmingham, which would have been a great boon, they thought, economically to the city because that whole area was deteriorating. So this is the first that most people have heard about this. It caught just about everybody flat-footed. He waited until this Public Service Commission meeting to even announce it. Well, that was like, then it's a done deal. Property sold, there's still gonna be a station, we're all for it. Here you have, here you have one of the last pictures of the station while it was still in one piece. This is looking for, from the Bankhead Hotel up Fifth Avenue. You're looking to the east and there's the station as it existed in 1969. Well, the railroads couldn't wait, so almost the next day, they began to pull up tracks in anticipation of building this new little station, which would be roughly in this area right here. This is on the north end of the station. And you can see the tracks are already overgrown with weeds because there weren't any trains. And here's the new station to take its place. It's a simple little block building with brick veneer up on the north end of the station. Finally, in November, that little station was ready so they could close the main station, the terminal station. And here's the last train to come through terminal station before they locked the door. This was on November 23rd, 53 years ago this month, that the city of Miami called for the last time. And almost the next day, they started taking out the waiting benches. They couldn't wait because this thing was costing them money. They were sweating out having to try to get the steam plant to work again that winter so they could have heat. They weren't even sure if it would work. So they were glad to get out of there, at least by that time. <clears throat> and then the wrecking ball went to work. <clears throat> this picture is especially poignant for me 
because they're knocking down the old control tower for our work. So this started in November, and by March, all that was left was a pile of rubble on Terminal Station. Now, you've seen this slide before, but I want to point out one thing to you, and that's what's circled in red. You see a kind of a wooden barricade there? Mm -hmm. That's where the station sat, the main waiting room sat, okay? And they got it barricaded to try to keep people away from it because the last thing they did when they took that down the station <clears throat> was to drop that dome, that 65 foot, 100 foot high dome, all right? When they dropped it, they really thought they had calculated it so it would just hit the ground and shatter. It was much heavier than they thought it was. And when they dropped the dome, it went through the floor into the Fifth Avenue subway. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, nobody was in their car driving through at the time. That would have been a rude awakening. No one was hurt. But the old gal had the last word. <laughs> kind of like that. That's poetic justice. Well, that would have been it as far as Terminal Station goes, except for one thing. Southern Railway, which was the primary owner of the station, and the one that took it down, had a new president, and his name was Graham Claytor. He was a Virginian. And as you can see, Mr. Claytor loved to play with trains. Mm -hmm. He was a train fan, okay? He was also the vice president of law during the 60s when all those stations and all those trains were removed. And he had a lot to do with that. He wanted to make amends because that wasn't what he wanted. That was what the Southern Railway's board of directors wanted. So one of the first things he did was start running steam specials. So folks who wanted to could see what an old steam engine looked like and ride the train. And he ran through, you know he came through Charleston on the way to Chattanooga. In fact, for this particular train, it was leaving for, for, Chatt for uh, London, Mississippi. 1968. So, so he brought back the old steam engines and he also decided to reconstitute one good passenger train that would be as good or better than any passenger train in the country and that was the new Southern Crescent. So he repainted all those diesels and he put some Southern Crescent lettering on them and got the best equipment they had left and he operated that train between New York and New Orleans all through the 70s did everything he could to get passengers to ride the train. He spent a lot of money, and it was a flagship train. It got the Southern a lot of publicity for all those years. But that was not the last either, okay, because Mr. Claytor was going to retire. And when he did retire in 1979, his board of directors said, okay, we're through playing passenger train, all right? Mm -hmm. So they pulled the plug on the train, and here's the last Southern Crescent to operate out of what was left of Terminal Station. This was on January the 31st, New Year's Eve, excuse me, January 31st, 1960, 1979. Here's a small group of well-wishers who come over from Atlanta just to say they rode the last Southern Railway passenger train into Birmingham Terminal Station. And this is Mr. Joe Webb, Nancy. And Joe is locking the doors to the Terminal Station for the last time. And this is when it officially ended. And there's a little, you might see a little notice there upon the door, that's an Amtrak notice informing the public that tomorrow's train, the new Amtrak Crescent, will operate from the new Amtrak station, which was the site of the old l &N station, where this all began, which is kind of interesting. So here it is the next day, and here's the new Amtrak Crescent, and the only thing different about that train and the train you just saw is that Amtrak locomotive. Everything else is the same. It's still the Southern's train, still operated by Southern, still crewed by the Southern. But it's just really interesting to me that here we wind up back where this all began, back in 1909. There's the Bank for Savings building, by the way, standing right above it. And that's the location now of the Amtrak station. Okay, so if you go down to 5th Avenue and 26th Street today, this is what you'll find. A wheat-grown block with a sale sign. 
What happened to that $10 million Social Security regional complex? Well, it seems that another developer was friends with Howard Pepper. Some of you might remember that name. He was a long-serving senator, and he had some influence. So somehow, that new regional facility went in over in North Birmingham and not on that site. But by that time, they had already taken the station down. It was too late to save anyway, and would probably have been completely out of reach for any group that wanted to try to save it, not to mention the maintenance costs, just the property costs, and it wasn't going to happen. So, thanks for the memories. Thanks for the memories. I mentioned something about the legacy of the station. Even though the station itself is gone, parts of it still remain, went into private hands. This large Romanesque window here above the marquee went into the Caraway Davies house over in Mountain Brook. There it is. Dr. Davies had a lot of money and he liked those artifacts. So he got the, the window and he got chandelier for his home. This eventually became an event center. There's been many weddings and other events there, and I think now it's a private residence again. I'm not sure. I think it's a Presbyterian church. Presbyterian church. No, I would call it Presbyterian. I think I'll have to visit. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know if you noticed these in any of the previous images, but these cast iron lines had attached the marquee by these big heavy chains that you know covered the entrance to the station, attached them to the wall, supported that big heavy leaded glass marquee. Those wound up in private hands. Of course, Mr. T.L. Bergen, who did the demolition, he wanted those for his own. So he bought them and had them cleaned up and put them on the gates to his demolition, demolition yard. And then he, he left that location and somehow the lion's head disappeared until within the last few years and they came up for auction and Mr. William Barber, Barber Racetrack, bought them and refinished them and put them on a monument out at Barber Racetrack in honor of Terminal Station. So thank you for that, Mr. Barber. One other thing I'll mention to you. Does anyone recognize this building? We mentioned a church here a while ago. That's the church at South Highlands Methodist at Five Points. Okay. If it looks familiar, that's Mr. Myray's design. The same architect that did Terminal Station did Five Points Methodist, South Highlands Methodist. What happened is when they were building Terminal Station, they were looking to build a new sanctuary. And one of the elders was really impressed with his work on Terminal Station. So they invited him to design their new sanctuary, and this is it. So you can actually go and see an intact piece of Mr. Myers' architecture in Birmingham. You'll probably notice it has a lot of the elements of Mobile Station in it, very similar. Okay, I said something about the legacy. Here we have the Alabama and O'Lyric Theaters, Alabama's new theater district in Birmingham. You may know that at one point the Alabama Theater was in danger. We were going to lose it had it not been for Cecil Whitmire and a few other folks into historic preservation. But when they were raising money for that, most people who donated said, we're not gonna lose the Alabama Theater like we did Terminal Station. Remember Terminal Station. I had the fundraiser for the Lyric Theater tell me the same thing when they were raising money for the Lyric's restoration. He said, people kept saying, we're not gonna let that happen again. We lost Terminal Station, we're not gonna lose another one. Even Sloss Furnace, okay, was about to be scrapped. The same thing happened. Remember Terminal Station, they raised the money for that. Even Vulcan, which was in disrepair and falling apart, was considered for scrapping, believe it or not. And once again, remember Terminal Station, and they raised the money to restore Vulcan. And there we have it today. 
I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Rotary Trail downtown. Okay, well, you recognize that sign, don't you? Yes, we brought back the old Magic City sign for the Vulcan Trail. So we have reminders and remembrances at Terminal Station all around to keep us reminded of the importance of historic preservation. Thank you. Well, 50 years have passed. No one had done a history on Terminal Station. And I had all these wonderful pictures, and I actually lived the experience of working at Terminal Station. I knew a lot of those folks had a lot of history, and I thought, this has got to be published. So I started to work in my 2016 and put together this book, which I entitled The Great Temple of Travel in honor of Terminal Station. It's got uh, 128 pages, it's got over 200 images, it's got a lot more detail about the station and the trains for those of you who might be interested. I happen to bring along a few copies. <laughs> I'll be glad to sign one for you. They're $35, cash, check, or credit card. Uh, but before we end, I would like to ask, uh, there she is, uh, Mrs. Davies. No relation to the guy that took the windows. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to present this copy of the book for the Trust of the Library and appreciation for hosting us today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jane, Jane, your turn. <laughs> I really appreciate you having me today. It's just great going before these groups and being well, able to talk about We're Terminal thrilled Station. that we could put this together. Thank you very much. You want to get a picture? I don't think so. She wants to take a picture. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are your questions? 